Okay, hey there, people of the internet. Um, I am here answering some questions um, from the GeoBus crew. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the California Institute of Technology in the geology department, and my specialty is paleoclimate. What that means is that I study um, ancient climates of different parts of the world, and I do so by using records that are stored in sediments and sedimentary rocks. I kind of liked a whole suite of classes. Um, surprisingly, I was really interested in classes that involve writing. So I loved um, English and I was on my school newspaper staff. Um, I also really enjoyed science. And I think that one of the reasons why I love science now and love being an academic scientist is because I get to write papers that tell stories. I think that my background in, in creative writing and journalism, um, I get to use that when I write articles that ultimately I want to publish. You know, I think that I'm still kind of deciding where I want my career path to take me, um, but I'm pretty happy being in science and being a researcher. I think it's really fun to constantly be asking new questions and using different methods to answer those questions, but I am not really sure when the exact point that I said, yep, this is what I am, this is what I'm doing. I don't know when that was, probably sometime in my um, 20s after I finished uh, my undergraduate degree. And there were several people along the way that kind of influenced me toward earth science. Uh, I had an earth science teacher when I was in eighth grade um, that was really fantastic, that made me really interested in the world around me. Uh, we, I had a close family friend who loved to take us on nature hikes and he would point out um, you know, the different species of trees we were looking at, or the type of bird we were listening to, or the rock that we were hiking on. And his encyclopedic knowledge of the world around us was really fascinating, and I was like, yeah, I kind of want to be like that guy. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a lot of different things. Um, as I said, I was really interested in journalism, so I thought I wanted to be a journalist. Um, I thought I wanted to work in international relations. Um, I never really thought that I wanted to be a scientist, even though I knew that I always loved science as a subject. And it wasn't until um, college when professors really told me that, you know, I could do this and this is how you turn it into a career. There's the, these are the different options. These are the different fields of science that I thought, okay, this is where I'm going with it. Um, so yeah, I don't think that because when you're a kid, you don't think I'm gonna be a scientist, doesn't mean you're not going to be. Also, one of the most awesome things about being a geologist is that you get to travel all around the world. So I did my PhD in New Zealand, and I've been to Alaska for field work, Switzerland for lab work, um, Japan for a conference, and also one of the biggest perks of being an academic and being a scientist is going to conferences, which are literally all over the world. So as I mentioned, I went to a conference in Japan last summer again in California. There's a, a yearly um, conference in California called AGU. And in about a week's time, I'm gonna go to uh, Southern Chile, to a town called Punta Arenas, and get to I get to present my research there. Although my research right now is focused on New Zealand, I definitely wanna expand that. I'm interested in other parts of the Southern Hemisphere. So places like South Africa or Australia or South America. And then also, you know, similar latitudes, but in the Northern Hemisphere. So I would love to do research in Iceland or parts of Europe or Canada. So several um, summers I did get to do internships and, and programs that really helped me um, or inspired me um, to continue in the path of science. Um, one was I worked um, for the Southern California Earthquake Center and was um, looking at different technologies to track where faults are now and how we can see them from satellite images and where they've um, been in the past. So we reconstruct changes in the fault, um, where the faults are located. Um, and that was really fun. It was one of the first times that I was given a project and had complete control over it and um, was using really cool software, really cool technology, and that was super exciting. Um, also, during my undergraduate um, program, I uh, went on a sailing trip where we um, were on a 
a tall ship, which is a ship that has two masts and a bunch of sails. And we were sailing the Pacific Ocean and also conducting our own research. And uh, so what I do day to day is really just research dedicated to answering a specific question or um, looking at a specific system. And on a day to day basis, what that means for me is that I'm in the lab a lot. So I'm what you would call a geochemist, which means I use um, chemical or chemistry based methods to answer my geological questions. So I work in a lab that looks very much like your school chemistry lab. You know, we've got um, flasks and test tubes and vials and um, acids and bases and solvents. And um, I'm doing essentially analytical chemistry, but with uh, geological samples. And I spend a lot of time in the lab. So I'm studying ancient climates of New Zealand um, and in particular, uh, atmospheric circulation patterns. So there's this strong band of wind called the westerly winds in the southern hemisphere. And they drive a lot of regional climate patterns and even global climate patterns. And so I'm looking at ways that we can reconstruct how the westerlies changed over the last 15 to 20,000 years. Um, and what I do is I take sediments and I extract all of this, all of a uh, component out of them called lipids. And Lipids are the same thing as fat in your body, and you can, you can take them out of the sediment using different types of um, liquids called solvents. And then in those lipids, there's information that stores changes in the environment, environmental condition at the time that the sediments were laid down. So what does that tell us about how rain patterns have changed over the past 20,000 years, how wind patterns have changed, and what does that mean about climate over New Zealand and potentially all over the Southern Hemisphere and all over the world? The project that I'm working on now, we're using, as I said, it's about the ancient climates of New Zealand, and we are using um, sediments from a lake in southwest New Zealand. This is a place called Lake Hayes. And um, it was really fun. I was just in New Zealand in November of 2015, and we collected sediments in these sediment cores. So you can imagine if you stick a straw into something solid um, and you pull it up, the stuff that it the, you know, the solid stuff that it went into will come up in the tube um, with suction. So it gets stored in the tube, and that's basically what we do with um, sediment coring, is you stick a tube down into the sticky sediment, and you pull the tube back up, and the sediment, the sediment stays inside. So we got to take these sediment cores from this lake basin, and it was this really awesome new platform, and you basically go from um, all of this equipment that is deconstructed and in the back of a pickup truck, and you build this big rig that you get to core from. And so you can be in the middle of this lake on these big pontoons collecting up to 25 meters of sediment core. And it's really cool that you can, you know, that people have developed these tools to do this sort of stuff. Um, so that was really exciting. Most of my work is actually on my own uh, as a postdoc uh, in other parts of my career. So as a grad student and um, eventually, if I were to become a professor, you are you work more in teams. Um, but it doesn't mean that I'm not part of a team now. It's just that my day-to-day -day work is pretty much on my own. But I'm in a collaboration or a collaborative project with several other people that are located all over the world. There's a lot of things that are very rewarding. Um, it's a tough job at times because sometimes you're answering questions or asking questions um, and you expect a certain answer and then something, it ends up being something totally different. And so there's a lot of head scratching in, in my line of work. And when you finally have that aha moment where it's like, oh, that's the way that this could work. It's incredibly rewarding. It's definitely sometimes delayed gratification, but it feels really good when you finally can put the pieces together. It's like a complex puzzle, um, and when you finally get to put the, pu the last puzzle piece in, it feels so great. My work doesn't have a direct impact on anybody or anything, but I have to focus on all of the indirect impacts that it has um, that I think are really powerful and really good. So because I'm studying climates of the past, that can be really important for understanding the future of our climate and where we're headed. And that's incredibly important in light of human-caused climate change because 
First, we need to know what was going to be happening anyway, and then we need to know what humans are putting on top of that. So really, my work, especially because it's um, over a shorter interval in geologic terms. A lot of geologists study things that are millions of years old. I'm studying things that are thousands of year, years old. My work tries to see, okay, what's the background um, climate variability? What does the climate system do on decadal to centennial to millennial timescales? So from tens to thousands of years. And what does that mean for humans um, and the future of our, our Earth in the next 10, 20, 100,000 years? So I think one of the things as a geochemist that you have to deal with is you're, there's a lot of steps between collecting your samples and getting data um, and then analyzing what that data means. So you have to be careful sometimes when you're generating geochemical data um, to make sure that you're being really thorough in each step and being, you know, that you're not introducing any other possible sources um, of information that you're keeping your samples as you know as pure as they can be and as um, representative or reflective of their original environment as they can be you know I know a lot of people in science that have such different personalities and such different backgrounds I think that it's very much it's such a creative field that it can be kind of whatever you want it to be so there are some people that are um, you know, very analytical, they're great with math, they're quantitative, and those people make fantastic scientists, obviously. But then you also have people that are really creative thinkers, and they're also fantastic scientists, because sometimes you have this data set, and it's confusing, and it takes somebody creative to see how all the different pieces could fit together, and to tell a story that might not be the obvious story. The most important thing is being passionate about it and loving what you do. Basically, after you finish a PhD, you can continue to do research for a, uh, a fixed amount of time. And the goal is to become a better um, scientist, a better researcher, publish more, and it's basically kind of on the career path that would lead me to being a professor. But there's a whole suite of things you can do as a geologist. Um, you can do, you can work in um, economic geology, so, you know, working in oil and gas or in mining. Um, you can work in consulting, geological consulting, um, or environmental consulting. So helping plan where, um, you know, big facilities should go. You know, if there's going to be a nuclear power plant, um, doing geologic surveys so you don't end up building that plant right on a fault line or, in, you know, an active seismic area. So yeah, there's, there's a whole slew of things you can do. There's, you shouldn't feel limited and uh, it's not like a single career path. There's definitely a lot of options. I think that it's super important that everybody be exposed to earth science. Um, one, it integrates all the different sciences. You get physics, you get chemistry, you get biology, you get math. Um, so one, it helps you learn all of those things in an applied sense. And two, it kind of helps us be better stewards of our planet. Probably right now, the two things that I love doing the most outside of work are cooking and um, hiking in the mountains. I live at the base of the San Gabriel Mountains, right outside of LA. And you wouldn't really think that LA would be a place that you can spend a lot of time outdoors, but these mountains are actually really beautiful and um, have amazing trails, uh, really cool desert plants um, and waterfalls. So I get really grounded just by being outside and spending time in nature. Um, and then I also really love cooking. Uh, I think that kind of, it's, it kind of reminds me, cooking and chemistry are kind of similar. In both cases, you kind of have a recipe that you should follow um, and the product is something exciting and cool. In cooking, you have obviously a little bit more liberty to change it up a little bit. And I think that that might be why I like cooking because you can't really do that with chemistry, although you can tinker a little bit with method. Um, but also, you know, with chemistry, you can't eat what you produce. So that's a big advantage of cooking. Um, okay, that's all. I hope you guys had a good time listening and uh, stay in school. <laughs>